Hello, and welcome to the video for chapter 21 on the topic of musical sounds, okay? So you could really name this chapter sound number two, because many of the ideas here are not specific to music, but are really ideas about sound. And so they very, they very much dovetail with the ideas that we saw in the last chapter. So you should really treat chapters 20 and 21 as one collection of ideas. So let's get to the ideas that are additional or presented here in chapter 21 on musical sound. Noise and music, musical sounds, pitch, okay? Sound intensity and loudness, this one very much is a general sound idea. Quality, and then musical instruments, Fourier analysis, okay, again, general idea, and then a little bit about DVDs, okay? So noise as compared to music. So noise corresponds to an irregular vibration of the eardrum produced by some irregular vibration in our surroundings, a jumble of wavelengths and, ap uh, and amplitudes, right? So it's many, many different tones, many different frequencies, many different wavelengths, okay? White noise is a mixture of a variety of frequencies of sound, and there are kind of different types of white noise. There's also things called pink noise, and so it all has to do with kind of the overall structure of that noise, all right? And there's a lot of things that cause noise, um, and there's, there's a whole kind of study of it. And obviously, you know, there's, there's some really interesting types of noise out there that come from things like the cosmic microwave background radiation, you know, but overall, noise is not very pleasant to the ear, okay? Sometimes it's a buzzing sound, right, you know? So that's noise. Obviously, it's not music, okay? Music, on the other hand, is the art of sound, all right? So finding the right combinations of frequencies that sound good and has a very different character. Musical sounds have periodic tones, or musical notes. And so it's there, they are composed of either a single frequency or only just a few frequencies that go well together based on human preference. And it's subjective, okay? So the line that separates music and noise can be thin and subjective, all right? So this, this is an example of a note in music. Notice it is a much more um, predictable pattern as compared to noise, okay? So what is a musical toy? tone? Well, there are three characteristics of a musical tone pitch, and intensity, and quality, okay? So what is pitch? Well, pitch is determined entirely by frequency. So pitch and frequency are very much synonyms, okay? And remember, frequency is related to wavelength on the idea that we have that, vol um, that the velocity of a sound is the wavelength over um, or times the frequency. Let me write that. So the velocity is the wavelength times the frequency, okay? All right, so anyway, so there, this is the frequency received by the ear. It is determined by the fundamental frequency, the lowest frequency. Because many musical tones are composed of multiple frequencies, they're all, they're all not a single frequency. In fact, single frequencies don't necessarily sound pleasant, quote unquote, okay? But when you do have a group of frequencies together that make a tone, it is the lowest one that is going to kind of set that tone, okay? Intensity, on the other hand, is a measurement of loudness. It has to do with energy per time, per area, okay? Just, just like we would talk about the intensity of light, the intensity of a sound wave is measured in the same way in terms of fundamental um, units, okay? Now last, there is quality, all right? It is determined by the prominence of harmonics and is determined by the presence and relative intensity of the various partials, which are partial harmonics, okay? And so that is very much uh, an idea that is kind of getting into the details of music, but we will discuss what a harmonic is, okay? So let's carry on with pitch. So pitch, because that's basically a big part of what we're gonna do now for the rest of this lecture, um, which is a relatively brief lecture, is get into what is pitch, what is loudness, and what is um, quality, okay? So first pitch. While music is organized on many different levels, most noticeably, most noticeable are musical notes. Each note has its own pitch, again, synonymous with frequency. We can describe pitch by frequency. Rapid vibrations of sound, high frequency produce the sound of high pitch. So a high frequency sound could be something on the order of 10 kilohertz, which would be like 10,000 hertz. That would be a high pitch sound, also a high frequency sound, okay? Something like right? That's high pitch. On the other hand, slow vibrations within the range of human hearing is a low frequency, <clears throat> excuse me, and that would be a low pitch. Maybe that could be something like 400 hertz. That'd be something like, 
Bo. Right? It's a much deeper sound, lower pitch, lower frequency. Okay? All right? So musicians give pitches different lettered names. Those are A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. So the notes A through G are all notes with one octave. Multiply the frequency on any note by two, and you have the same note at a higher pitch in the next octave. Okay? A piano keyboard covers a little more than seven octaves. And notice how we can match up the actual frequencies, right? All the way down at the very low, 32 hertz, all the way up to something like 4,186 hertz, okay? And these match up with the, um, the letter, so the musical note, the pitch, C, but in different octaves, all right? And it's a little bit more than eight octaves because you know we see the eight one ends up here and we didn't quite start, right? So the keyboard covers a little bit more than eight octaves. It's the same, it's the same sound, okay? It's the same pitch, but at progressively higher frequencies, okay? So different musical notes are obtained by changing the frequency of the vibrating sound source. This is usually done by altering the size, the tightness, or the mass of the vibrating object, all right? So we can see here that this, this sound here with a longer wavelength, okay? The longer wavelength would result in a um, a lower frequency, so this greater lambda, greater wavelength, so let's say if lambda goes up, the wavelength goes up, the frequency goes down, which means that the tone then is lower, the pitch is lower. When we, as on the other hand, when we have a shorter wavelength, that would be a larger frequency, which would be a higher pitch. So the narrow tube in this case is creating the higher pitch, the wider instrument, the wider tube of the instrument is creating the lower pitch. All right, so high pitch sounds um, used in music are often less than 4,000 4, hertz, but the average human ear can hear sounds all up to 18,000. So I guess my 10,000 hertz example is a little extreme. Very high pitches usually don't show up in music because they're all kind of basically all unpleasant. Um, but I guess you, you could have some music with 10,000, but that's really, really maybe beyond, beyond pleasant music. I'm not a musician, so that's, I guess that's my bad judgment. All right, but then so a high pitch in music is 4,000. Okay. Um, and Fun fact is that um, children can hear higher pitches than 18,000. They can hear up to about 22,000, but they quickly start to lose the ability to hear those higher, higher frequencies, even by the time they're five. So some people and most dogs can hear tones of higher pitch than this. The upper limit of hearing in people gets lower as they grow older, as I, know, as I just said. And the high pitch sound is often inaudible to older, um, older people and yet more clearly heard by a younger one. Because for the most part through your adult life, you're going to kind of be right around the 18,000 until you really get into geriatrics and then the, 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 the frequency starts to fall off again. And so someone might be in their 80s or 90s might only be able to hear up to 14 or 15,000 hertz. All right. So the intensity of sound depends on the amplitude of pressure variations. Okay. So now we're on to the second um, aspect of music, intensity. Intensity and loudness are really, really related, but we'll distinguish kind of what, what we mean by the two. All right. So again, it is the amplitude of pressure vibrations. So if we were to consider this picture here with that had a uh, wavelength in it, had a implied velocity and had the relationship between wavelength lambda and frequency f, what was not mentioned of course was the amplitude. So the amplitude is very is the loudness. It is how much pressure there actually is in the regions of high pressure and in the how low the pressure is in the regions of rarefication. Okay? So the human ear responds to intensities covering an enormous range from 10 to, the, 10 to the negative 12 watts per square meter, the threshold of hearing, to more than one watt per square meter, which is the threshold of pain, right? When a sound is so painful that it could start, start to cause your eardrums to bleed or cause permanent damage, okay? All right, so we see then that we have a 12 order variation, all right? So tw 10 to the 12 um, in variation. Okay, and again, notice the units here. Notice that intensity is measured in power per area. Okay, that's the same way that we discussed the intensity of light, but here we're discussing the intensity of sound. Okay, and you can see that this really is not at all specific to musical sound. You know, by any stretch of the imagination, it applies to all sound. All right, but 10 to the 12 in variation is a huge range. In fact, that is one trillion. So in other words, the human ear can pick up sounds that are a trillion times louder than other sounds. It's hard to imagine such a huge range, but they just show up quite a bit in biology. It is remarkable the, the, that how life 
can pick can you know evolve to have huge range of in, huge ranges of inputs something that we have not quite caught up with in terms of machines okay so we see this in terms of um, the intensity of light as well. The human eye can pick up is basically a single photon, although the cortex doesn't necessarily register it, but the, um, the midbrain will. And then, of course, we can also look at things that are incredibly bright. All right. So that's a very similar idea, the huge range of light that the eye can pick up, and in this case, the huge range of sound that the ear can pick up. The, the human nose is not quite as impressive, but of course, other mammals' noses are. Okay. So there we have a trillion variation a in terms of the lowest to high the highest loudness that can be perceived okay so because the range is so great intensities are scaled by the factors of 10 with barely audible being 10 to the negative 12 that's that is a reference intensity called zero bell all right a unit named after alexander bell a sound 10 times more intense has an intensity of one bell or 10 decibels all right so you maybe you've heard of, probably haven't heard of bells, but you've probably heard of decibels because it turns out that since there's so many of, you know, this, this variation that we end up using decibels more than bells. All right. So you can even see here, DB decibels is the unit for sound level. Okay. So all the way at the threshold of zero of, of hearing 10 to the negative 12 Watts per square meter, we have a decibel of zero. And that, so this, this idea, this sound level scale is a anthropocentric scale. In other words, it's a scale that was designed specifically for humans based on how the average human ear works. All right. So that's kind of the origins of it. But then mathematically, it is a logarithmic scale and logarithmic scales are common for anything that involves a huge variation here, a trillion in variation, all right, or 12 orders of magnitude in variation. Okay. And the actual formula for decibels would be 10 log and then intensity over the reference intensity, where the reference intensity is none other than that 10 to the negative 12 watts per square meter. Okay, so this is the formula you would use for calculating decibels. So if I wanted to know how much louder something was, and I was told that the intensity of this loud sound was 10 to the negative 5, watts per square meter, so for example, then if I want to know its decibels, then it's always in reference to the threshold of human hearing. So I take 10 to the negative 5 over 10 to the negative 12, put it inside the log, and then just do the math 10 times the log of 10 to the negative 5 over 10 to the negative 12, which then would give me a value of 70. All right. So that's great for comparing things to the threshold. But if I want to compare between two sounds, I can also do I can put something other than I not in the denominator. I could put say 10, 10 to the negative eight in the denominator and, st and get a delta decibel. Okay. All right. So that's, that's the way the formula works. You can just plug it in. You can also solve for I, but you, know, you have to actually raise everything to the power of 10 in order to, um, to undo the logarithm. Okay. So sound intensity is a purely objective and physical attribute of sound of the sound wave. And it can be measured by various acoustical instruments. Loudness is a physiological sensation. Okay, so that's how I, that's how I said you know decibels are anthropocentric. There's there's you know specific to humans, whereas sound intensity is purely objective. Right, anything other besides you know humans as well as any machine would pick up loudness. All right, or I should say sound intensity, which is watts per square meter, but loudness is very much a human experience. All right, so the ear senses more frequencies better than others. So there's actually there's the idea that the if we're going to measure um, and kind of think about how, how well that decibel scale works, it's, it's kind of best at maybe a frequency of about 1000 Hertz, which is kind of a really typical frequency we hear very much in our everyday lives, where our ears don't work as well at the higher frequencies and the lower frequencies, okay? So a 3500 um, Hertz sound at 80 decibels sounds about twice as loud to most people as a 125 Hertz sound at 80 decibels. And the kind of this unit, this unit for loudness is sometimes called the phone, all right, our phones are the unit, okay? So humans are more sensitive to the 3500 hertz range of frequencies. All right, so finally, the last attribute of music, quality. So we have no trouble distinguishing between the tone from a piano and a tone of the same pitch from a clarinet. Each of these tones has a characteristic sound that, is dif that differs in quality, the quote-unquote color of the tone, the timbre, 
All right. So this is a very uh, you know complicated idea, and it has to do with kind of with the 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 all the composite sounds that make up the subtle differences from the different instruments. Timber describes all the aspects of a musical sound other than pitch, loudness, or length of tone. Okay. Quality. So most musical sounds are composed of the superposition of many tones differing in frequency. The various tones are called partial tones or simply partials. The lowest frequency, called the fundamental frequency, and I mentioned this in passing back two chapters ago, determines the pitch of the note. A partial tone whose frequency is a whole number multiple of the fundamental frequency is called a harmonic. A composite vibration of the fundamental mode and the third harmonic is shown in the figure. All right. So this is, besides this being related to the quality, I want us to pay attention to this idea just on its own as an exercise in harmonics and standing waves. That's the key, that was the key term um, two chapters ago in chapter 19. All right, so this is the longest wave, the harmonic, is the longest wave, that the first harmonic that is, is the longest wave that can exist on this particular string. If you think of it as a string, this would apply to um, a, a wind instrument and a tube as well, but here we might as well visualize it as a string instrument, okay? And the nodes are just the end, those are fixed points. Remember, nodes are created due to the law of reflection of the wave, okay? This right here is an antinode, so that's the term we saw before. But the point here is that this harmonic has a length that is the entire string and half a wavelength. All right, so it's one. Um, so we could say that L, the entire length from end to end, is equal to one half the wavelength. How do we know it's half the wavelength? Because this is only half of a wavelength, right? A full wavelength looks like this, okay? So this is half a wavelength. The reason it's kind of spread out is because we're imagining it vibrating up and down. And that first, that first harmonic has that special name. It is called the fundamental, all right? So fundamental is just the name for the first harmonic. If we look at the second harmonic, then in this case, we look in the, then L, no, excuse me for doing that. L is then equal to exactly the wavelength, All right? So we have now that the wavelength is shorter. Okay, because as we go up in harmonics, the wavelength becomes progressively shorter. Right here, L lambda, the wavelength was equal to twice the length of the string. Now, in the second harmonic, lambda, the wavelength is just equal to the length of the string. All right, we could even consider the third harmonic. In this case, we have that L is equal to three halves the wavelength. So, in other words, lambda is two thirds of the length of the string. We can clearly see that because this right here was lambda. See? And then finally, we have the fourth harmonic, where L is equal to twice the wavelength. See the trend? All right. It's basically, we just, it's going to be, it's going to be the order of the harmonic over two, right? It's N over two. First, we have one over two, and then two over two, which just becomes one. When N is three, when it's the third harmonic, it would be three over two. All right. So then for progressive harmonics, it's N, make that look like an N, N over two times lambda for nth harmonic. Okay? And then this is the idea of timber when you add together harmonics and you get a sound that looks like this. All right? So there you go. That's the idea of standing waves and harmonics. Okay? So a little bit more about quality. The quality of tone is determined by the presence and relative intensity of those various partials, those lower harmonics, um, well, higher harmonics, lower wavelengths. The sound produced by a certain tone from the piano and a clarinet of the same pitch have different qualities that the ear can recognize because their partials are different. All right, a pair of tones of the same pitch with different qualities have either different partials or a difference in the relative intensity of the partials. Okay, all right. So, a little about musical instruments. Vibrating strings, vibration of a stringed instrument is transferred to the sound, the sounding board and then to the air, all right? So the idea is that the vibration is transmitted as a mechanical process and eventually then vibrates the air molecules at a matching frequency. So then, that, then that vibration air molecules propagates through the air, reaching your ear, causing a vibration of a special organ in your ear. All right, and air columns, like a brass instrument, woodwinds, the stream of air produced by, um, by the musician sets a reed vibrating, fives, flutes, and piccolos, the musician blows air against the edge of a hole to produce a fluttering stream. All right, percussion, striking a two-dimensional membrane, the tone produced depends on the geometry, elasticity, and tension of that vibrating surface, and the pitch, the pitch produced by changes in tension. Okay. Electronical musical instruments um, differ from conventional musical instruments. They use elect um, electrons to generate the signal that make up musical sounds the mo um, and modify sound from an acoustic instrument, or it depends on the composer and player that demonstrate an expertise beyond the knowledge of musicology. All right, so here's an interesting idea. 
Fourier analysis. What is it? Okay. Well, Fourier analysis is a big theory in mathematics and physics, and it tells you that you can compose any complicated wave by just summing up an infinite number of sine waves. So what it says, it says that the sound of an oboe displayed on the screen of an oscilloscope looks like this. Okay, so this is the oboe just picking it up on a oscilloscope, which is just a, a, a device that measures um, the, sig the electrical signal, in this case, electrical signal produced by some sort of vibrating circuit. All right, so the sound of a clarinet displayed on the screen of an oscilloscope might look like this. And then the two together will look like this, the composite of the two. All right, so Fourier discovered a mathematical regularity to the component parts of periodic wave motion. He found that even the most complex periodic wave, like something like this, you know, very complex, as long as it's periodic, can be disassembled into simple sine waves that add together. So you can always add up sine waves to get any shape wave. Fourier found that all periodic waves may be broken down into constituent side waves or different amplitudes of different amplitudes and um, frequencies. The mathematical operation for performing this is called Fourier analysis, and its implications, its applications in the modern world cannot be overstated because it allows us to take any sound and actually distinguish that sound in a, in a, in a quantifiable way. So a computer can hear something, do a very quick Fourier analysis because it's the, the computation has been shortened and is built into so many microchips, and then, what, then, the, then the computer or the device exactly knows what that sound is. It can reproduce that sound, it can mirror that sound for the purpose of sound cancellation, and, and it can do things like, you know, kind of like uh, improving the, like the signal. Think about how, you know, you don't hear a bunch of static on a phone and compare that to, you know, to phones from, you know, like that are from the past, okay? So when these pure tones are sounded together, they combine to give the tone of the violin the lowest frequency sine wave is the fundamental and determines the pitch. The higher frequency sine waves are the partials that determine the quality. So this is the idea. This is taking this complex sound, which then just ends up being the sum of these three harmonics, the fundamental second and third. So, and you could really imagine adding one on top of the other, uh, one on top of the other, right? So if I took the sine wave and I added the other one to it, right? Then I'm going to get this effect, right? And then I add even the, the shorter and lower amplitude and the shorter frequency on top of that, then we get a shape like this, okay? And that's the idea, is that we, we can kind of imagine going the one way and adding them together, but what Fourier does is it does the opposite operation. It goes from the complex wave and, and calculates what were the waves that built that complex wave. So the output of phonographs, records, um, uh, was signals like those shown below. This type, this type of continuous waveform is called an analog signal, and the analog signal can be changed into a di di digital signal by measuring the numerical values of its amplitude during each split second. All right, so this is the idea of actually taking that measurement and perhaps doing a Fourier analysis as well. Okay, this is just talking about how how then um, little little tiny microscopic. Right, this is done with a a, a, um, a scanning a scanning um, electron microscope. This image here, it's artificially colored, but you can tell that this is done with a scanning microscope. All right, and so then this is the idea of actually then getting those particular um, sounds through a laser on a disc, okay? All right, so we'll wrap it up there. But big ideas here were decibels and harmonics, okay? And yes, understanding a little bit about some of those key terms about quality and pitch and so on. Certainly the Fourier analysis is a very in interesting modern application of, of understanding sound and understanding waves and a big mathematical idea. But the big things that you're gonna be accounted for, accountable for are understanding decibels and understanding um, the idea of harmonics. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for watching this video. I hope it was interesting.